we talk about math, science, history, and trains, and do it all with some very fun activities. Hello, I'm Mr. Bob, Education Director for the National Railroad Museum. If you're watching us on Facebook Live and would like to type in a question, well, feel free to do so. We'll answer those after today's segment. Also, if you want to just type in and let us know who you are and where you're watching from, we'd love to hear from you. Also, make sure that you like the National Railroad Museum's Facebook page. Well, this is coming up on one of my favorite times of the year. No, not just springtime. We're coming up on May 10th. And that is the anniversary of the completion of the Pacific Railroad, or as we might know it, the Transcontinental Railroad. On May 10th, 1869, the gold spike to complete the railroad was driven at Promontory, Utah. It's quite the festivities for that day. It was a major accomplishment in our nation's history. Our country went several weeks across from coast to coast. A matter of days, because now you could take a train away from New York to San Francisco. But surrounding the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad and the Gold Spike Ceremony, or as it was called, the Mountain Wedding, a number of historical facts that over the past 151 years have become a little bit distorted. Let's take a look at a couple of those and unravel a few mysteries. At Promontory on May 10th, 1869, three photographers that were recording the event For the southern central Pacific is handing and labeled a bottle of champagne over to the engineer for the Union Pacific Railroad's locomotive. Well, of course, here's the first kind of trivial little misnomer. It wouldn't have been champagne because that is only produced in the Champagne region of France. This would have been sparkling wine in California, brought along by Central Pacific President Leland Stanford. There's a couple other things about this photograph that you will want to notice. If you look at the railroad tie here, notice then they are cut nice, even edges. Normally it is thought that this photograph was taken directly over the point where the gold spike was placed. Well, not so. Nearing the end of construction, the Union Pacific was incredibly strapped for cash and their railroad ties were no longer being cut in a sawmill, but in a lot of cases were being very crudely hewn out by To take the photograph, what actually happened was Union Pacific Locomotive 119 moved forward to touch train ties there. Now, Andrew Russell's photo is often confused with another view taken by Charles Savage. Savage was a photographer from Salt Lake City, and shortly after that first image that we just looked at was taken, Savage reposed the group and took his view of the scene. We can tell that this was taken later because the engineers have in fact changed their uh, bottles between the two sides. Folks are differently. You notice here we no longer can see the actual tracks. But with the Savage photo, another little wrinkle. This is actually the second post of Savage's image. See, Savage was taking a lot of photographs for the Mormon church 
based in Salt Lake City, Utah. The Mormons did a great deal of grading work for the Union Pacific as they were moving through Utah and toward Promontory. The first image that uh, Savage took featured many of the same people in the Russell image that we just saw. This, the second version of the Savage image, features elders from the that were involved in the construction. The third photographer that was present at Promontory was Alfred Hart. And Hart took his image shortly after the driving of the gold spike. He is looking from the Central Pacific's engine back toward 119, the Union Pacific's image. And here you can clearly see the differentiation between those railroad ties. Here, Central Pacific ties neatly hewn out. You can see the Union Pacific tie here that has been crudely cut. So when you're looking at photographs from the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, and especially Promontory and the Gold Spike Ceremony, you have to look with a careful eye to see really what's going on. Now, another mystery to unravel about the Transcontinental Railroad. Many people will say that the Transcontinental Railroad started in Omaha, Nebraska. That was the eastern terminus. Well, yes, on the map here of the Union Pacific, Omaha is prominently featured. And yes, track did begin there for the Union Pacific Railroad. However, if you go across the Missouri River to Council Bluffs, Iowa, you're going to find in the city park located on 9th Avenue, this Gold Spike Monument. You see, by executive order, Council Bluffs, Iowa actually was the eastern of the original Transcontinental Railroad. This was placed in 1939 during quite a joyous celebration in Omaha, which marked the opening of Cecil B. DeMille's Union Pacific, featuring Barbara Stanwyck and Joel McRae, a movie about the Transcontinental Railroad. Folks came across the river into Council Bluffs and placed that particular monument. But you're probably still asking, well, why and how did Council Bluffs become the originating, originating eastern or the original eastern terminus for the Transcontinental Railroad? Well, for that, we have to turn to President Abraham Lincoln. Didn't the Pacific Railroad Act? will was Lincoln labeling Council Bluffs at the, as that eastern terminus. It turns out that before he became President Lincoln, Lincoln owned land in Council Bluffs, Iowa, mysteriously right around the point where the rails began by his executive order. And Lincoln, like many other people, wanted to make sure that his land would have value once the railroad came through, thus naming Council Bluffs as the eastern terminus for the Transcontinental Railroad. There have been dozens and dozens of books written about the Transcontinental Railroad, websites containing tons of information, movies and videos as well. And I often get asked, what book would you recommend to read about the Transcontinental Railroad? Well, I will tell you that my favorite happens to be Empire Express by David Hayward Bain. Now, if you'd like to do some more reading and research on the Transcontinental Railroad, after the segment, I'll be posting on Facebook a reading list that you can further explore. This will also appear on our website. Go to the Education tab, scroll down to the Activity Zone, look for Mr. Bob's Railroad Work, and you can find it there with today's episode. So a little bit about the mystery surrounding the original Transcontinental Railroad. The National Railroad Museum inspires lifelong learning by providing dynamic educational opportunities through the preservation of railroad objects, engaging exhibits, and creative programs. As a nonprofit educational institution, we are supported by both public and private donations and, of course, our museum members. 
For more information on how you can support the National Railroad Museum or become a museum member, visit our website, nationalrrmuseum.org. As always, thank you so much for your continued support. Hey, I'm Mr. Bob. Thanks for visiting Mr. Bob's Railroad Workbench, and we hope to see you again real soon.